Shalom Uvracha. Welcome to Monday School. I invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 39. Before we do, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity that this day holds for us to come to you, uh, that you, you tell us to come to you if we labor and are heavy laden and that you will give us rest. And while sometimes we find ourselves personally in a, in a good space, we are in contact with folk who are struggling, who are facing difficult days. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would give rest to those who find themselves overwhelmed, those who find themselves laboring to try to live a, quote, normal life, whatever that is. And uh, as we approach this most holy time of the, of the church year, as our hearts turn to Calvary and beyond that to the resurrection, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would enable us to trust you, to reach out to uh, to reach beyond where we where we normally are and to cast our every care upon you, knowing that you care for us. We ask especially your touch upon Wally Reed. We thank you for his clear testimony as to the love of Christ and the salvation of his soul. And as he faces difficult days ahead physically, we ask that you would give him the comfort that you alone can give. We ask your touch upon Judy Finauer that you would enable her to uh, recuperate from the surgery that she has had. We ask for strength and healing for her and uh, encouragement and strength for Don. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, continue to be with David's neighbor, Jamie, who has undergone a liver transplant. Would you, O oh Lord, bring her through the difficult days ahead? And for uh, uh, Tina's uh, acquaintance through a relative, a young man named Roger, who has a, a difficult uh, physical issue that is really beyond uh, the medical, um, the, the usual medical care. Would you, oh Lord, touch him in a way that uh, sets him free? from this condition and gives him a, an opportunity to testify as to your not only miracle working power, but that, that you display your love in the lives of people in a way that is truly supernatural that you are mighty God. For those who have, have registered unspoken requests, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would go to the point of need and show yourself to be mighty God on their behalf. Now prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, not only for this lesson, but for the days ahead as we look toward the the next week when we celebrate the resurrection. Um, help us, though, to not leap over this week in which we consider with uh, sober intent 
uh, as we as we consider all that Jesus went through to demonstrate to us his love. For we ask it in his blessed name. Amen. So, Mark chapter 15, starting with verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. I would remind you to be on the lookout for the pronouns here. And we've just had the, the pronoun they used five times in four verses. So uh, there's this uh, Mark goes right for it, whatever he's going after. And so it's up to you to consider who they are. And uh, their identity changes a little bit throughout the passage, but I just thought I'd point that out. Verse 25, it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews... They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the, of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him Heaped, also heaped insults on him. Verse 33, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, Why? Have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. So, back to verse 21, Simon of Cyrene. We meet him only here in the scriptures. We do not in, know anything else about him. Historically, he seems to have disappeared from the scene other than there are references to St. Simon of Cyrene. But exactly what he accomplished and and what difference he made in the early church, we do not know. However, it is not notable that 
He is identified as the father of Alexander and Rufus. And apparently they are known to the early church. We don't know if they are the same Alexander and Rufus, but in the uh, uh, finishing verses of the book of Romans, the 16th chapter, round about the 13th verse, the Apostle Paul makes a reference to Rufus. And uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 16, that Alexander is identified, there is an Alexander, we don't know if it's the same one, who is identified in Ephesus that he has been brought forward to speak to the uh, the crowd that has gathered and is a, on the verge of rioting, and they know that if they bring out Paul, they'll tear him to pieces. So uh, they bring out Alexander, and before he can speak to them, when they find out that he is of Jewish uh, extraction, they start chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and do so for about two hours, working themselves up to such a frenzy that they have to disperse, excuse me, to disperse the crowd to avoid full-blown rioting from breaking out. They don't want the Roman government to have to get involved in establishing, reestablishing peace. So there are, on the scene, uh, there are individuals who are apparently going to be involved in the early life of the church. To what extent, we can't be exactly certain, but Mark takes the time to note who they are. Uh, and it says that Simon was forced to carry the cross, that they, the Roman soldiers who were in charge of the crucifixion, that they forced him to carry the cross. We have no idea what uh, his, his presence there meant, although Mark seems to imply that he was passing by on his way uh, from the country. Apparently, he was headed some place in particular and just happened to be in the right place at the right time. There are some people who would say the wrong place at the wrong time, but he was where God wanted him to be at that moment, and he was impressed into the service not only of the Roman government but of the king of the universe. They brought Jesus to Golgotha, a rock-like formation. And it's interesting, some of the photographs that I've seen that Pastor Joe has shown, uh, that, that there is something that looks like a skull, like a face, but it has been covered up by uh, architecture, uh, part of which seems to have been to try to stabilize the slope and the rest of it, who knows, but uh, it's partially obscured. And it's ironic that how, how often humanity ends up uh, partially destroying something that is uh, uh, an, an article of beauty over their desire to, to get close to it. I'm currently involved in a project uh, over near Teleco Plains where there's a little waterfall that the slopes adjacent to it are breaking down because people are overusing the area. It's so beautiful and they love it so much that they're tearing it apart. And uh, it's, it's ironic that those who seem to treasure it most 
are its worst enemies. So, uh, back to verse 23, they offered him, they offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Myrrh is uh, not only used as a, an embalming uh, compound, but that it was also used what we would, uh, it's like a, a local anesthetic, that it was the sort of thing where you would imbibe some, that it wouldn't make the pain go away necessarily, but it would, it would put you in a state where you didn't care as much, that it dulled the sensibilities, took the edge off. And Mark lets us know that Jesus would not take it, that he wanted to fully experience everything that was before him. He was there not to avoid pain, but he was there to bear the sin of the world and that this was not an accident. It was not a miscalculation in any way that this was his mission and he was fully set on completing this mission uh, for which he had come into this world and taken upon himself human flesh. They crucified him. Again, Mark gives us no details. He just says they crucified him. And they cast lots to see what each would get. They stripped him of his clothes and, and took it away, distributed it to those who were involved in the execution. So it was nine in the morning when they crucified him and that this written notice that we read elsewhere, we're given a little more detail uh, and I encourage you to read all of the, the gospel accounts of the crucifixion. But there's one place in which we are told that uh, the sign that was hung over his head uh, said, the king of the Jews. Now, normally, the individual who is being executed was identified by a sign that was sort of at eye level, down lower. In this case, it was above his head. And it was written in three languages so that everyone who saw would be able to see what it said. And, and when the the chief priest and the scribes saw what had been written. They went back to Pilate and tried to get him to, they, they were looking for a revised version already. And uh, uh, they wanted it to say, he said, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate said, I have written what I have written. And what he had written was, the king of the Jews. So Pilate makes that judgment. The, the irony and one of the astounding facts of, of all that's happening here is that despite recognizing that Jesus is in a total different league than in everybody else, and, and Pilate, having recognized that the, the legality of what's going on here is, is unquestionably off-center, that despite recognizing him as the king of the Jews, he still 
did nothing substantial other than to make verbal cues to try to get them to back off. But when it came right down to him issuing an edict, he did nothing to save Jesus. He did not deal with the Godhood of Jesus. He met God face to face and failed miserably. And I would encourage each of you to make sure that you haven't failed in that regard. We have had recent testimony from Wally that he has seen the Savior face to face and has bowed the knee and opened the heart completely. Um, so, they crucified two rebels with him, one on the right, one on the left. Uh, so, Jesus is on the, the middle cross. And that he faced the insult, the indignities of being scorned first by those who were of the, the upper level, if you will, the highest of the Jewish officials that they first heaped their scorn that you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, that, that this really got under the skin of some of them. It's kind of interesting that Herod spent 46 years working on the temple and never quite got it done, uh, yet nobody ever criticizes him for dragging things out. Jesus brings things to a knife focus, a laser focus, at, at the cross and he's about to show them what he meant when he said destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up that he was not talking about a brick and mortar building he's talking about this temple that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit so he saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Now, the interesting thing here, their wording, that he, he saved others, but he can't save himself. The reality is he saved others, but he won't save himself. And why is it that he won't save himself? It's not that he can't. It is that he won't because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He told us that, that he came into the world to save sinners. And the only place from which he could do that was the cross. That John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming his direction, said, Behold the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sin of the world. And he doesn't take that sin away by just sort of, uh, poof, it's gone. But that the sacrificial system had shown that a perfect lamb must be sacrificed in order for sin to be dealt with. And now here was not just a perfect lamb, but the lamb of God. This is the lamb hand chosen from God's flock. It's a flock of one. He is the only begotten son 
of the Father. And so, at noon, by the way, there's one more thing in verse 32. It says, let this Messiah, this king, and they're being derisive, they're pointing at him, this, this one, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. The implication being that if he came down from the cross, they would believe. And notice very carefully that they say that we may, not that we will see and believe, but that we may see and believe. Give us this evidence and anything else that we might ask for in order for us to believe that he is who he says he is. And they heaped other insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Now, this darkness that came over the land, Amos chapter 8, starting with verse 9, and he's talking about the day of the Lord. He says, On that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts and remember, this is the Passover feast. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist, baldness on every head. I will make it like the mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day that Good Friday, the death of Christ, that the only reason we can call it good is not because the sacrifice has been offered. The only reason we can call it good is because the third day he arose from the dead. And so, when Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why, why, lama, that's the Hebrew word, that an Eli is, El is God, Eli is my God. Okay. that Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, why, why have you forsaken me? And he's quoting Psalm 22, the ultimate Messianic psalm, which 800 years before the Roman use of, of the cross as capital punishment was in regular use. You read Psalm 22 and see if you don't hear the anguish of someone being crucified throughout the psalm, introduced in the first verse by these words that Jesus cried out, from the cross. They said, listen, he's calling Elijah. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. And so, once they give him something to drink, then they say, leave him alone and let's wait and see 
if Elijah comes. But with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Now, the, these final two things, and, and you can see how in just these few verses, the verses 21 to 39, less than 20 verses, and, and Mark has been so precise and, and almost brutal in the way that he describes what took place. No explanations. He just throws it out there. And so the last thing, two things that he throws out, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And then verse 39, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Pastor Joe pointed out to me this morning that these verses, as, as eloquently as they speak, and they're very blunt, and they just tell us, this is what happened. But who would have been standing in the vicinity of the curtain of the temple? A priest, and possibly the high priest, And it's likely that the high priest is standing there when the, the veil, the curtain of the Holy of Holies that prevented anyone, anyone from seeing the Ark of the Covenant where they believed that the Shekinah glory of God rested, that when the veil was torn in two, that the high priest was confronted with the reality that God was no longer there. He was not at the beck and call of the high priest, that he was departed. In that very same moment, the centurion, this rough Roman soldier who shoots it straight, is standing in front of Jesus and when he saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The trained theologian missed it when he was there to see in life, and he missed it as he departed this life. But this pagan Roman soldier sees the Holy Son of God as he dismisses his spirit. And the centurion says, this is the Son of God. Behold, the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have done. And for all that you are going to do in the hearts and lives of men and women, boys and girls, who give themselves without reservation to you. Let every heart prepare you room 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.